will actually bypass uh, the very, very simple alignments that we might do uh, in the beginning of a demonstration, and, and we'll jump to a couple more uh, advanced alignments. And so typically in these demos, we're doing something like a 3-2-1 or one of these canned alignments where we're just simply aligning off of geometric features. Uh, in this particular case, I'm starting with a CAD model where the origin is off somewhere in space in regards to the actual, say, corner or surfaces of the part. Uh, so my go-to alignment for these types of scenarios is a CAD alignment, which is going to allow me to pick a number of points on the CAD surfaces. So a minimum of six points. In this case, I'm going to pick eight. And then immediately, we can ask the software uh, to allow us to measure those points. So using the joystick, uh, on my machine, we'll measure these eight points. If I zoom out a bit, you'll see that the location of my CAD model in regards to the location of the probing and these points that I'm about to measure, of course, don't line up. But then after just quickly taking some points, again, a minimum of six, we'll immediately have a scenario where this CAD model synchronizes to the actual location of the part on my machine today. So it looks like two more points, just using what I'm seeing in the graphics as a bit of a roadmap, if you will, for where I should be measuring these points. And then finally, we get some confirmation here. So it looks like I've got one or two of these points that I measured maybe in the wrong location. Uh, so actually here you'll see I can include or disinclude some points uh, from my alignment. Uh, so I went from a case uh, using all eight points, uh, to having an overall deviation or an average deviation of you know, a little over a millimeter. So one of these points I probably measured on the wrong surface or measured too quickly with the CMM, uh, where if I disinclude that point, then I've got an alignment here with an average deviation of less than 16 microns. So this is just the best fit alignment. It gets our CAD model into the correct location for us. Uh, biggest benefit being, you know, now that we've done that initial alignment, instead of using the joystick over here and, and moving the machine around, uh, I can actually pick some points using the CAD model uh, and ask the software to immediately measure those points for me. So here you can see the machine's moving, taking just an individual point. And I'll take three or four points on the top surface. And then we'll measure our secondary and tertiary data. And it's probably a circles on this top surface of the part. So what I'm preparing myself for is to perform what's called an RPS alignment. So the RPS alignment will take a combination of point type features, typically um, something like surface datum target points like we've measured here on the, the top plane. Uh, in this particular case, they all happen to be coplanar. They could be on a more irregular shaped part at different Z heights or at different heights in regards to the primary data. So immediately afterwards, I'll measure the second uh, type of feature, a circular feature that we'll use as a secondary datum. And you'll probably see immediately that we have in the graphics an S and an E along with these green paths. So that's signifying the start and the end of our path that we're creating. As we start adding more features to our program, we'll talk a little more detail about these paths that are created. Uh, and we'll talk about going in and editing uh, measurements that we've created as well.
So at the end of this measurement, the probe is moving up to this end point. And we'll come back to that. So this clearance move that's here, uh, all of these clearance moves, uh, short of the, the feature at the very end of your inspection routine, will automatically, in almost all cases, be removed and replaced with some more efficient type motion or more efficient path at, during our programming process. So before we get to that point, let's take these six measured features and throw them into this RPS alignment. So with the RPS alignment, we're picking some series of features. Again, all point reducible. We're applying some constraints. So the four points on the top are constraining Z. And the larger diameter circle is constraining X and Y. And then finally, the circle at the, uh, I'll say, four o'clock position is constraining just the Y axis. So when we click OK, OK, this is an over constrained alignment. I've got more than just three datum target points. I've actually got four. That's fine. <clears throat> now I've got a complete DCC alignment. Uh, as always in CMM Manager, in the cases where you've got multiple alignments in your program, we should resynchronize the CAD model uh, after our, I'll say, final alignment or uh, improved alignment. And from this point on, just a quick confirmation in our status bar, we see a green checkbox indicating the CAD is in fact synced. So let's go ahead and start programming some more features. So maybe just a reminder, the feature that we just measured previously was the circle with an endpoint all the way up at the height of the probe at this particular moment. So just by virtue of adding a newly measured feature, you notice the start point of this feature is down you know, very low to the part. And then again, the last feature with the endpoint up high. So you'll notice if we revisit this measured circle too, that endpoint that was all the way up here, uh, it was actually removed. So by virtue of adding this new uh, measured circle three, that path was adjusted. And you'll see that over and over again. So if we program just a series of circular features here, And then a couple of different scenarios, maybe one I'll measure in this particular case, cone. And there may be some point where I'm looking at this program and I recognize that, you know, maybe I should have measured this cone immediately after measuring circle four. And so I've got kind of an out of sequence type scenario here where I could have a more effective probe path just by moving some features around. So I can take this feature and drag and drop it to some different location in my program. And you notice upon doing that, the path for this feature, uh, cone one that's highlighted right now in my program changed you know, from the start point being adjacent to circle seven to now the start point being adjacent to circle four. So as I index my cursor through this program, you see that path you know, updated uh, in a similar fashion by placing my cursor somewhere different in the program, you know, not always adding features at the end of my program, but adding features anywhere in the program that I choose. And I can pick, in this case, the slot, and the start point now is, of course, adjacent to the previously measured feature, uh, circle three. And then you'll also notice that circle four, where the start point was here previously, uh, by virtue of adding this measured slot into the program, uh, the start point of this circle has been updated automatically. So there's some pretty clever things going on with CMM Manager in terms of uh, path creation and, and path execution uh, during the course of programming these features. Uh, the next one being the fact that I can pick a feature, uh, not only uh, cases where we're using the currently selected tip angle or the currently active tip angle, the cases where uh, a tip index might be required, or, or maybe the case that you've got a star probe, uh, software would automatically, instead of doing a tip angle change, maybe use some different index on your star probe. So if I verify this measurement, you'll see the software automatically is creating a path 
where it's using some different tip angle to access the circular feature on the side of my part. So a couple more examples. We'll quickly look at some reporting and we'll wrap up for today. Again, this is just a quick summary of what we would normally go over through the course of a full hour demo. So here we'll pick a feature. And you'll notice immediately software is using what may seem to be a strange tip angle, A45, B90. So it's doing this in an effort to access all six points that I've asked the, the software to measure. So here, in the case of a plane, uh, I've got target points, so two rows of three points. Uh, going back, in the case of like our circle features that we've measured, uh, we've asked the software to measure, in this case, five points. Of course, you can make changes to all of these just by keying in a new number and hitting this Create Path button to update the feature measurement. So going back to our plane, before we measure this plane, let's manually select a tip angle that we know is going to be maybe a more conducive tip angle for measuring this particular plane just as an operator knowing, or as a programmer knowing that immediately afterwards, uh, I'm gonna be using that same A0, B0 tip angle for some other measurement. So really in an effort to reduce the number of tip angles that we have in our program, I'll repick the same feature and show you now that you've got some control. So an intermediate programmer, yeah, maybe they wanna use this full auto option where the software is automatically choosing the tip angle for them. Uh, a more advanced operator or programmer may choose current tip auto path where we're restricting the software to use the currently selected tip angle. So I've still asked for two rows of three points, but you'll notice when this measurement is performed, the top row of points, all three are measured. This lower row of points, software automatically skips the center point. It measures the two points on the, the outside corners there, uh, as well as adding some additional clearance moves so that it can successfully navigate the probe from one side of the part to the other without colliding into the sphere. So it's just a taste, again, of the path planning capabilities. Uh, one more feature that we'll measure here so that we can get to reporting. Just an irregular surface. And similar to the plane measurement, I've got some adjustments that I can make. And just a quick, quick tweak to the uh, I am displaying my CAD model. And we'll recreate this path. So here you can see I've asked for 30 points. In just a single row, you know, of course, it may be I want to measure three rows of 30 points. You know, so it's kind of up to you on these irregular surfaces, the type of uh, measurement density that you're applying. So <clears throat> while this is inspecting these 30 points, uh, just kind of wrap up what we've looked at with path planning. You know, so again, uh, taking into consideration the, the total volume of your machine, the, the CAD model, not only of the part, but maybe CAD models of things like probe changers or calibration spheres that you may also have active in your environment are all gonna be taken into account when these paths are created uh, automatically. Uh, and then of course, if you've got an articulating probe head, like today on the machine, I've got a pH 10, so I can articulate this probe head to all different orientations. Uh, and then also in the case of you know, maybe using star probing, or something like a, one of our Nexus vision systems that doesn't have an articulating head. Uh, so instead we'll use a star probe, uh, but you're still gonna be able to take advantage of automatic path planning. So features that are located on the sides of the part will be accessed automatically in a similar fashion, just by picking the feature from the CAD model. So that feature measurement is complete. And just a quick shortcut method for a couple report outputs here. So here I've output using a disk display, a bunch of annotations. Actually, in this case, I'm going to hide all of the individual annotations 
Uh, we can change some settings with these disks um, in terms of size. You know, how big do you want these disks to be dis displayed? Uh, we can change more what we see in terms of this uh, legend. And then effectively, we see some color correlation here between uh, the amount of deviation and, and you know, what we see in the bar graph. Conversely, maybe we want to look at this instead of these colored disks. We want to use the uh, spike option. Uh, and again, there's some settings related to spikes so that we can change the line thickness to make them more viewable. And of course, I can change the magnification. I can magnify or demagnify the size of these spikes. If I look perfectly through the back of the part, that gives you kind of a 2D cross-sectional view of all of these individual points that we've measured. Maybe I just want to mark the min and the max so that shows me the highest and the lowest deviation on that curved surface. In the end, I end up with a report output that looks something like this. And then with some text recording that's also included. So let's take one more step backward to our program from the reporting tab. We will create a report output for all of these features. And then we've got also that plane that we measured. We'll do just an angle output. So we're looking at the angle between you know, this plane here that we've measured and our XY work plane. And then what portion of that angle am I interested in? Basically matching what I see here to what I might see on the blueprint in terms of the portion of the angle that we're after. And then finally, take all of these report outputs that we've just created, add them into my other report here that contains the graphic, and we end up with something like this.